Um, there have been some other descriptions, but there, there do appear to have been two craft involved, um, whether they collided with each other or not. But descriptions also of bodies which were found, including apparently at least one survivor. There's new information about that in the book from uh, U.S. Army Air Force's guy who's now deceased. And they describe the bodies consistently as, as relatively small, four, four and a half feet high, humanoid, um, bipedal, two arms, relatively large head. And in fact, there's, there's a sketch based on a description by um, a lieutenant, a nurse, who was present at one of the autopsies of these creatures. My guest in conversation is Timothy Good. He's the author of his book, Need to Know, UFOs, the Military and Intelligence, where he's collated a whole lot of documents from the US and UK military where, and intelligence services, which talk about UFOs and their interest in UFOs. After that incident, it seemed to kick off a, a great deal of interest in the military and the Air Force, US Air Force in particular in UFOs. Tell me how that interest was maintained over the years. What kind of a watching brief did the Air Force, US Air Force have on UFOs? Well, there was there was panic in the military at, at the time, and if I if I can um, cite uh, General Clements McMullen, who was uh, Deputy Chief of Strategic Air Command at the time, he said, "Look, we'd just gone through World War II with firebombing of of, of uh, great cities, two atomic bombs, destruction on an unprecedented scale. Then came this flying saucer business. It was simply too much for the public to have to deal with." He didn't add, of course, of course, that it was too much for the military to have to to deal with. But that's what happened, and it was contained. It was compartmented. The intelligence about the subject was compartmented, and unless one had a specific need to know, as it's called, um, in intelligence circles, you would not gain uh, the high security clearances that access this this extraordinary we're, information. And that's how it was set up. Well, in were 19- presidents informed by this? Were presidents Truman, President Eisenhower, Truman Kennedy? President Truman was aware. President Eisenhower was aware. But not all presidents have been inform- informed. It depends on need to know. Um, I would say that presidents who don't have a military background are not popular with the military, and they are far less to access um, any information. Why did they say nothing at the time then? I mean, they, you'd assume that if they were told about these things that they'd be ashen-faced and you'd start hearing strange and interesting rhetoric coming from them. Well, a number of people did come forward, all sorts of, sort of generals. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, for example, he even said that uh, the next war is going to be interplanetary, that there are, there are some – there's, uh, there's a, a conflict situation – uh, facing us in the future. Um, all sorts of people came forward. General George Marshall told someone um, that you know, there was concern in the military about possible panic, and that I find all over the place. But there are other reasons. I think um, there is a conflict situation. Uh, one of the main reasons for secrecy in the early days was that in May of 1947, when the Americans were testing V-2 rockets captured from the Nazis, and they brought Werner von Braun and his team over, and they started developing them. The UFOs, already excited by our nuclear developments, excited in a very negative sense, were buzzing around White Sands, New Mexico, and, and areas like that, and a lot of weapons storage facilities. They were flying around sometimes the V-2 rockets, and in one of the early ones, at least one of them was knocked out of um, its trajectory and crashed uh, prematurely. And this led to the military, actually, uh, this was confirmed officially by the commanding officer at White Sands Base. I've reproduced the newspaper article that that, um, peculiar phenomena were responsible for bringing down a V-2 rocket. And then the Americans started attacking any discs, flying discs, as they were then mostly called. Attacking them with what? With anti-aircraft weaponry, ordnance at first, and then, I'm told, with um, on occasions with ground-to-air, a ground-to-air missile with a proximity fuse, which would explode, a very powerful explosive, um, close to to these objects. And they apparently, according to uh, my sources, they succeeded in shooting down several of these craft. Who would have authorised that decision? That led to one to the Roswell incident. Okay, so that's what led to that's what you're you're saying led to the Roswell incident. Who who would have had to have authorised that? President Truman would have had to authorise that. I imagine so. 
firing at yes. strange objects in the sky. Absolutely, would... yes. And then what happened, Richard, which, is, which was a shock to me when I learned this from a very reliable source in the States, who I've named and I've given his details of his background, he found out in his research that following our attack on these things, there was an unprecedented wave of aircraft accidents worldwide. And again, I've reproduced a, a newspaper article from the, news, from the New York Times at the time. There were hundreds of accidents, sometimes dozens in the same day in the United States, not just military aircraft, but airliners. And this went on for a considerable time. Who was your source on this? A guy called uh, John Andy Kistner. He's a former a New Mexican state representative for Las Cruces. He has very good connections. He worked in the aerospace industry for, for many years, and he's very, very genuine in my opinion. Jimmy Carter, President Carter, famously spoke about his, his, his belief in the existence of UFOs. Yes, because he saw one, yeah. Because he saw one? Yes. Where? This was in Georgia. He said it was, it was quite large, and they were all observing it, and it was not the, the moon. People have, have, have debunked his sighting. Saying, "Oh yes, Peanuts Carter. Uh, he just he just saw he just saw the the moon or Venus or whatever." But I I would remind listeners and that <laughs> Jimmy Carter was a line officer on on nuclear submarines, um, and he had a very very strong military background and knowledge of what, what you know what stars look like for heaven's sakes in the navy. <laughs> Ronald Reagan has said things as well. He often talked yes. to Mikhail Gorbachev at the idea that, well, well maybe we'd all get together with the Soviet let, Union let in me, America if I'm uh, glad you mentioned we, that we'd because, be attacked from outer space. Well, this is what, this is what um, President Gorbachev said in, two years after the Geneva summit. He stated at, a, um, at the Kremlin Palace, the United States president said that if the Earth faced an invasion by extraterrestrials, the United States and the Soviet Union would join forces to repel such an invasion. I shall not dispute the hypothesis, though I think it's early yet to worry about such an intrusion. Oh, I think he's clear. you can read sarcasm in that, can't you? I mean, uh, no, because because starting in 1984, I believe, the Russians and the Americans began to collaborate. This is confirmed now. The, the number of um, scientific and, and military sources in Russia have confirmed that the United States and the Soviet Union began to collaborate uh, because of the problems of UFOs interfering with intercontinental ballistic missiles. And we began to realize that there was a more serious threat posed by um, some of these craft at least. And this is why this led to a collaboration which is still going on, I'm told. And Reagan himself, um, this was towards the end of a very important speech before the United Nations General Assembly in 1987, said, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet, I ask, is not an alien force already among us? Then he added, what could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat of war? But I do think he was trying to tell us something. Why? Because he had a deep interest in UFOs. He had had two sightings, one of which was at, as governor of California. And... He actually admitted his deep interest uh, when, when, as governor of California, in his private plane, the, he asked his pilot to chase the UFO, and everybody on board saw it. And it just so happens that there was a Wall Street journalist there, and Reagan was sounding off about his passion for UFOs and going absolutely berserk, apparently, and, and then suddenly mm -hmm. suddenly realized he was speaking to a journalist. Timothy Good's my, good, my, uh, my guess, I should say, on the conversation hour. He's the author of Need to Know, UFOs, the Military and Intelligence, where he's put forward documents from the military and intelligence services suggesting that UFOs are indeed present. Recently, a couple of months ago or so, we had Professor Paul Davies on the conversation hour, and Paul Davies yes. is the head of the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence's yes. Post-Detection Committee. And I asked him if he, he, what he thought of the existence of UFOs, and he said he doubts sincerely that they are things that belong to extraterrestrial intelligences. He thinks they're more likely a form of strange form of mass hallucination that we don't really fully understand. And I'm just wondering if, if you could explain it in those terms insofar as the visions people often have of sure. the Blessed Virgin Mary in Yugoslavia or sure. of an Indian goddess in India. It, could it be explained in those terms? 